Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. Herbert Hoover said that the business of America is business. And for decades, really, no business better defined that than General Electric. An industrial titan, everything about it, from credit to jet engines, from x-ray machines to lighting the nation, to bringing entertainment to the masses, defined the broad shoulders of American business and American capitalism. As might be expected, Its executives also lived the good life. Like an episode of Succession, there were multiple private jets, cars always at the ready, and offices that make today's tech offices look provincial. There was the office staff waiting to fulfill every executive whim, and CEOs like Jack Welch and Jeffrey Immelt that became household names and were seen on the covers of Fortune and Business Week. Today, after 130 years, GE, like many companies of its era, has all but disappeared. Like so many companies of that era, Polaroid, Kodak, Dow, U.S. Steel, we were led to believe that it was creative destruction that took them down, that Clayton Christensen's innovator's dilemma had caught up with them. But sometimes we discover in hindsight that it was simply bad management, bad decisions, hubris, and the idol worship of what William James called the bitch goddess success that turned its ugly gaze on the company. This story... A cautionary tale about management, men, and money is the story that my guest William Cohen tells in his latest book, Power Failure. A former Wall Street investment banker, William Cohen is the New York Times bestselling author of The Price of Silence, Money and Power, House of Cards, and the award-winning Last Tycoons. He was a longtime special correspondent at Vanity Fair and is a founding partner of Puck, which you all should be subscribed to. He writes often for the opinion pages of the New York Times and the Financial Times at Airmail. And it is my pleasure to welcome William Cohn to this program to talk about his newest work, Power Failure, The Rise and Fall of an American Icon. Bill, thanks so much for joining us. Well, Jeff, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I have to thank you for that incredible introduction. You summarized the situation beautifully and articulately, and I really appreciate that. Well, thank you. I want to start with with this broad idea. To, you know, a mere twenty one years ago, in two thousand and one, as you talk about, General Electric was one of the most valuable companies in the world. Twenty one years later, it barely exists. How much was external forces, and how much was as a result of of what took place inside the company? You know, that's sort of a a great debate, obviously, and uh, you know one that uh, was sort of the genesis of the, of my desire to write this story. You know, what what happened? What the heck happened to this once great company? That was the mystery that I was trying to solve. Um, after, you know, three years of interviewing everybody I could uh, and researching it extensively, doing this all myself and, and writing up this book, I, I think I have the answer, uh, which is, you know, obviously, there's always external forces that prey uh, and play hard against what a company is trying to do. It's the job of the executives uh, at the company, the management of the company, on behalf of the company's shareholders and creditors, to be able to navigate that macroeconomic environment. Uh, you know, and the turn around and look around corners and be able to anticipate the problems that might arise, or even if they can't anticipate the problems that arise, because sometimes things happen, you know, relatively quickly, like probably few would have anticipated or have anticipated or did anticipate, you know, the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, but that's their job, and it's their job to do that. And that's what they get paid a ton of money to do, as you pointed out. And so, if they don't do it, then they've got to take the responsibility for what happens. So uh, personally, uh, I think uh, the the responsibility for this goes uh, mostly uh, to Jeff Ilmolt uh, for uh, you know making decisions that ultimately he may have thought they were right along the way, but uh, you know it's easy to to judge you know in hindsight in twenty twenty. Uh, vision in hindsight is always in hindsight is always twenty twenty. Uh, but I, but I think you know he was warned at various things along the way. He made other decisions that he thought were right. And I think you know it's pretty clear to me anyway. He might disagree, and I'm sure he does. That uh, that he is ultimately to blame as the CEO for what went wrong here 
with this once great company. The other theme with respect to that, and we've, we've seen it so many times throughout business history, I mean, arguably we're seeing it even right now with respect to Disney, is that when some CEO comes in and follows a legendary successful CEO, it is a very hard road to hope. Yes, yes, it is. And or it can be. I mean, look, uh, you mentioned Disney. OK, you could have easily have also mentioned another company in your backyard. You could have mentioned Apple. Steve Jobs dies tragically, um, replaced by Tim Cook. I don't think anybody gave Tim Cook uh, much of a chance of succeeding, let alone succeeding wildly like he has. I mean, how do you follow a legend like uh, uh, Steve Jobs, who books have been written about, right? Uh, and yet when uh, Tim Cook took over from Steve Jobs, uh, uh, Apple was worth around $300 billion, and now it's worth $2.5 trillion. So, you know, put that in your pipe and smoke it. I mean, it's an incredible accomplishment by Tim Cook, yes. But, you know, it, it doesn't have to be uh, that way that following a legend is, uh, you know, an impossible task. Uh, you know, I think if Jack Welch had chosen someone other than uh, Jeff Immelt, if he had chosen Jim McNerney, who went on to become the CEO of Boeing, uh, maybe the outcome would have been different. Uh, or Dave Cody, who went on to become the CEO of Honeywell and made Honeywell more valuable than GE. Uh, it's, you know, it's it's hard it's hard to know. I mean, it's a hypothetical that we'll never sure. know the answer to. Uh, what we do know the answer to is that Jack Welch told me in no uncertain terms during our many interviews that he believed he had made a mistake in choosing Jeff Immelt, which is incredible on its own, considering Jeff Welch is considered one of the best CEOs of all time. And the most important decision a CEO makes is choosing his successor. And he chose Jeff. So that's also part of Jack Welch's legacy. You wonder, I mean, Jack Welch didn't have to navigate the problems of 2008 and, and many of those external forces that you talked about before. And, you know, you can't prove a counterfactual, but he may have had trouble navigating what came next with respect to the company. His decisions might have been similar to the decisions that, that ML was forced to make. Again, we, we, we just don't know every... Uh, there's only one CEO at a time. Uh, every CEO faces different uh, macroeconomic uh, problems and threats, but not every CEO deals with it the same way. Like, you know, Jeff Immelt, uh, uh, you know, as he told me, it was like Zulu warriors uh, coming after him, you know, month after month, you know, in and around 2008 and beyond. Uh, and he felt sort of, uh, always under attack, you know, and he decided ultimately to get rid of GE Capital and get GE out of the financial services industry. You know, if you look at what industry performed best or among the best in the years following the 2008 financial crisis, it was the survivors of the financial crisis. I mean, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, it was suddenly worth, you know, $400 billion making $40 billion of profit a year. Uh, you know, that doesn't sound like a company that's struggling. GE Capital was once one of the largest financial services companies uh, in the world with a very low cost of capital. Now, maybe after the financial crisis, that cost of capital went up. But maybe instead of abandoning GE Capital, which, you know, deprived GE of a huge source of its earnings, 50 percent of its earnings were coming from GE Capital that he couldn't replace uh, and he was unable to replace. And that led to his downfall. Uh, maybe if he had stayed in the financial services business and just modified it, uh, you know, around the margins and made different decisions about how GE Capital financed itself, uh, it might have uh, led to a very different outcome. Again, you know, these guys make the decisions they make. It's easy to judge in hindsight. I think somebody who understood the risks in finance uh, and in banking better than G than G Jeff Immelt did, who was really a marketing guy, uh, a graduate of Harvard Business School. Uh, it it would have uh, had a very different outcome. I think if Jack Welch were running 
a GE now, uh, you know, or, or in the years after, you know, if he had stayed on, I think he would have made very different choices and GE would still be around today. But, you know, of course, we'll never know. And of course, decisions pile up on top of each other. I mean, the GE Capital, which you talk about in the book, but also the fire sale of, of NBC Universal. You know, a huge decision uh, by Jeff Immoltz, which Jack would never have made, you see, because Jack loved NBC Universal. He loved, well, there was no Jeff bought Universal, but he loved NBC. He created CNBC. He created MSNBC. He he diversified NBC into the cable business way ahead of his competitors. He loved it. He loved going on CNBC. Uh, so he would never have gotten rid of it. Uh, Jeff uh, Immelt uh, decided uh, sort of in the aftermath of the financial crisis that selling NBCU is kind of like low hanging fruit and, and, and an easy way to generate cash for GE, uh, which obviously he felt it needed. Uh, and so uh, he decided to sell it. He sold it to Comcast in two, two waves of selling, first a uh, 51% stake and then the rest uh, for a total of around $30 billion. You know, a few years later before the pandemic, NBC Universal was worth a hundred billion dollars. So you know that's seventy billion dollars of value that Jeff Immel sort of leaked out of GE. Uh, again, hindsight is twenty twenty. But Jeff, Jack Welch never would have sold uh, NBC, uh, and uh, you know I believe Jack Welch would have run an auction for NBC Universal, and that's not something that Jeff Immel chose to do because he was very worried that uh, Comcast might walk and he wouldn't get the $30 billion or so that he was hoping to get uh, because he thought he was sort of in desperate straits. And, you know, that's not the way to make the best decisions. Uh, you don't ever want to do anything out of desperation and you never want to do anything, uh, you know, sort of impulsively. Uh, and I think, you know, by the time of March uh, 2009, uh, uh, Jeff was acting very impulsively uh, about this, and he decided to sell it. Talk a little bit about what I guess George W. Bush used to call, or George Bush Sr., the vision thing. I mean, Welch always seemed to have a vision for where he wanted to take the company, that it was not reactive, that it was forward-looking. And one of the things you come away with in, in, in Power Failure is the sense that Immelt was always being reactive. Um, you know, I think... There's a lot of truth to that, but it's not not you know I have to give Jeff Immelt, uh credit uh, for uh, you know having some strategic vision. Not a lot of it worked out, but he wasn't without it. So uh, you know he, you know I think his overriding vision for for GE was that it had to diversify away from financial services. Uh, you know, people forget this, and I think this is an important point to make, that um, the reason that Jack Welch stayed on for a, a roughly another year at GE after he was originally going to leave in twenty uh, in 2000, he, just, he ended up leaving in September uh, 7th, uh, 2001, uh, four days before 9-11, was that uh, GE uh, wanted, Jack decided that after... Uh, uh, a competitor, uh, UTX, United Technologies, uh, had reached a deal to buy Honeywell. Uh, that G that that J G Jack wanted GE to buy Honeywell, uh, and so he uh, trumped United Technologies deal and had a merger agreement to buy uh, Honeywell, uh, and that was going along fine, and the market seemed to like that, and that would have, of course, you know, been a big way for GE to diversify away from GE Capital and to go get more industrial businesses into its portfolio. Uh, but then, you know, and the U.S. quickly approved the deal, uh, and I'm sure Jack thought that was fabulous. But then the EU uh, started examining the deal, and he ran into a lot of trouble with the EU, and Mario Monti in particular. Uh, and uh, Jack... Uh, resented the fact that the EU wanted him to sell a bunch of businesses out of Honeywell or GE that he didn't want to sell. And as he told me, uh, you know, he wanted to buy an 18-hole golf course, but he felt like he was only getting 15 holes. And so he resented that, and he decided to pull the plug on the Honeywell deal. 
And uh, he did that sort of unilaterally and uh, didn't really consult Jeff Immelt on that. And, uh, you know, that left kind of a big hole in what Jeff Immelt thought GE needed to do. But uh, he sort of plowed ahead. He uh, spun off GE's insurance businesses into Genworth Financial. He did not like the insurance business. Unfortunately, he left two lingering pieces of that behind that later came back to to a bite GE in 2018 many years later you know he bought Amersham which was a big medical equipment device manufacturer spent 9 billion dollars doing that and that i think probably worked out better than most people thought i have to give him credit for that even though a lot of people thought he overpaid at the time um uh, that deal probably worked out very well and that's the first company to be spun off out of GE uh in january uh, he was warned, though, uh, about the risks by none other than Bill Gross, you know, the one-time right. bond king uh, of the risks that GE uh, faced in GE Capital and the way it was financing itself. Uh, uh, Jim Grant from Jim Grant's Interest Rate Observer was constantly harping on the dangers that GE Capital that Jeff ignored. Um, and so that, you know, come, you know, the financial crisis in 2008 is we discussed uh ge needed a bailout a very serious bailout even though everyone was focused on wall street and not ge but uh you know jeff had to go hat in hand to hank paulson to get a bailout uh, because he couldn't roll over his commercial paper uh and then you know managed to get that bailout got three billion from warren buffett another 12 billion from the market another 30 billion from the sale of, of nbc Universal, and then he decided to get out of GE Capital, uh, probably selling it all too cheaply, and then bringing in a hedge fund who he thought would be uh, supportive of him, but was an activist hedge fund, Tryon, Tryon Partners, uh, Nelson Peltz. And, and that, uh, unfortunately, came back to be uh, Jeff's Achilles heel when he couldn't produce the earnings that he had promised uh, through the sale of GE Capital, uh, what he thought was a benign presence uh, in his capital structure, you know, this hedge fund came back and uh, uh, wanted his head and got it in June of 2017. Talk about the role that the board played in during ML's time running the company. It's a hugely important uh, point, and uh, the board... The, the board basically abdicated its responsibility here. Uh, I mean, it's one of the larger uh, uh, failures of corporate governance that I have seen. Uh, obviously, whenever there's a dead body on the floor, uh, you know, and the corporate autopsy is done, uh, you know, uh, the board has a huge responsibility here, as, it, you know, it did in when I wrote about the collapse of Baird Stearns. The board there uh, had a huge responsibility. Uh, but I found it like in both cases, like, you know, uh, whether it was Jimmy Kane at Bear Stearns or, or Jeff Immelt at GE, you know, uh, CEOs have a huge ability to uh, proscribe what the agenda is at a board meeting or, you know, if questions start getting probed too deeply. They have an ability to deflect it and obfuscate and, you know, keep it out of the boardroom and the agenda. You know, anytime anybody at GE questioned what Jeff Immelt was doing, um, Jeff didn't like that. And, uh, for instance, Ken Langone, who was appoint appointed by Jack Welch and was a very outspoken board member, raised questions about what Jeff Immelt was doing in the early 2000s. And Jeff Immelt got rid of him. Later, uh, Sandy Warner, who was the CEO of J.P. Morgan, uh, raised uh, questions uh, about what Jeff Immelt was doing and and who his successor might be, and uh, Jeff Immelt didn't like that and got got rid of uh, Sandy Warner. Uh, so the like you know the message went out loud and clear. Uh, you know you challenge me, I'm going to kick you off the board. And you know being on the GE board was of course the most uh, desirable and and prestigious board to be on. And, you know, so that was all very troubling to me. And as troubling was the fact that when I reached out to board members to who were on the board at this time to get their 
perspective and to ask them to provide uh, interviews to me. They like ran like cockroaches when the lights come on. They literally disappeared. Only a very, very few had the guts to talk to me. And I found that to be truly reprehensible because they had a big responsibility here and they totally abdicated it. And then they're trying to pretend that it never happened. Some of them even going so far as to remove from their resumes the fact that they were on GE's board of directors, which is extraordinary to me. How much real estate did Jack Welch occupy in Jeff Emmelt's head? How much did the legend of, of, of Welch occupy the decisions he made and the way he thought about what he needed to do? It's, you know, it's a great question, uh, and thank you. I mean, a huge amount of, quote-unquote, real estate. I mean, obviously, J- Jack uh, handpicked Jeff and sort of rammed the decisions through the board, uh, so Jeff knows that without Jack, uh, in his corner, he never would have been CEO. Uh, on the other hand, there were a lot of things that Jack liked that Jeff, uh, didn't like, like being in the insurance business. Uh, and so he moved quickly to get out of it through the creation and the IPO of Genworth financial, uh, you know, in March of 2008, when uh, uh, in the first quarter of 2008, uh, you know, after Bear Stearns collapsed uh, and Jeff had promised the street that he was going to make something like $5 billion of net income for the first quarter of 2008. And it, after the collapse of Bear Stearns, uh, for a variety of reasons, it looked like it was only going to come in at $4 billion, you know, which is a big miss in GE land and, you know, a very, you know, a big no-no to Jack Welch. Jack, Jack went on CNBC and, and on national television said that if, uh, you know, Jack, if Jeff, if Jeff Immelt misses earnings again that he'd promised to make, he was going to take out a gun and shoot him. So, you know, uh, that's, he was obviously joking in the way that, you know, people uh, colloquially joke, uh, but that obviously offended Jeff deeply. Um, uh, I don't think they ever spoke uh, much again after that. And uh, but Jeff never came out and criticized uh, uh, Jack. You know, even to me in our many interviews, even in Jeff's book, uh, which came out in 2021, he never really came out and criticized uh, Jack. Uh, you know, the, earlier this year there was a book by David Gellis, uh, of, you know claiming that of uh, the New York Times claiming that Jack was the man who broke capitalism, a, a premise I totally disagree with, uh, utterly and in every way. I think it's completely untrue, but nevertheless, uh, it was book was published. Even then, uh, after all that Jeff has been through and knowing that my book was coming out as well in all of our interviews, he never criticized Jack and he came out on, on LinkedIn and and issued a statement, you know, defending Jack. So uh he wanted to remake the ge that jack had made in his own image and he did it and it didn't re- really work out as he thought it would but yes in answer to your question uh jack welch of course the legendary ceo the ceo of the century uh occupied a huge amount of territory in jeff immelt's mind and you know, in the mind of the rest of uh, GE as well. Uh, but I think an, a, a different CEO would have made different uh, decisions. And I think uh, another CEO uh, would would have had it uh, made it so that GE would still be around today. I don't think it was inevitable that GE had to disappear. And finally, how much do you think about Jack Welsh's legacy and, and, and the way he operated as you watch the Twitter story unfold today? Well, I mean, uh, uh, Elon Musk is, uh, you know, a sui generis individual. Uh, uh, you know, talk about a, a textbook case of how not to uh, manage a workforce, right. uh, you know, I mean, and we were basically three weeks into his owning it, and he's, he, you know, he's on the verge of destroying this company that he literally just paid forty four billion for. It's extraordinary. Obviously, Jack Welch would never have done anything like that, nor would Jeff Immelt have done anything. No normal human being CEO would have done anything like 
what Elon Musk has done in three weeks at Twitter. But obviously, you know, uh, Elon Musk is not your regular human being. He's the richest man in the world or, or was. Um, and so uh, it's just extraordinary what he's done. He, he had a huge financial uh, problem that he himself created at Twitter by overpaying for it. And he layered on that would have been bad enough and dangerous enough. And then he's layered onto it this huge operational disaster that was totally self-inflicted. It's literally amazing to watch this happen. Uh, and if he had the guts to listen to somebody else aside from his own huge ego, this never would have happened. But there we have it. You know, when you're the richest guy in the world, you know, just sort of like Donald Trump, if you, you know, if you listen to people who told you not to run for president, you wouldn't have been president. Uh, so he decides he doesn't have to listen to anybody. What all of these stories tell us is that no matter how big these organizations are, whether it's the Twitters of the world or, or General Electric at its height, that it's it's human beings that make decisions that, that drive these giant companies, and those decisions have profound impact. Very well said. William Cohn, his book is Power Failure, The Rise and Fall of an American Icon. Bill, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you, Jeff. You really did a masterful job. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you so much.